Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute for today's Small Biz Hangout. I'm Chris Dacielis, Regulatory Specialist at the NHLBI, and the host of today's event, Protecting Your Pitch. In a moment, I'll be introducing our presenters, but first, I would like to share a little bit about our office. The Office of Translational Alliances and Coordination is the office at the NHLBI that coordinates our Small Business Awards program. Our office includes people with expertise that you usually don't see in NIH offices. We have a regulatory specialist, business development advisor, entrepreneurs and residents, and even an investor in residence. These experienced professionals are available to our Small Business Awardees as well as our academic innovators participating in any of the multiple translational programs supported by the NHLBI. And it's our hope that uh, by accessing these expertise, uh, we are enabling our innovators to really take advantage of those earliest stages of transitioning technology off the bench and into the market. One of the support activities that we've developed is what you're attending today, our Small Biz Hangout series. The Small Biz Hangouts are a series of educational webinars intended to provide you, biomedical innovators, with information about knowledge areas that you probably didn't learn during your formal education. These are topics that, as an innovator and an entrepreneur, you need to have at least a basic understanding of in order to be successful in bringing a novel biomedical technology to market. The series addresses regulatory matters relevant to different technology types, understanding market analysis and customer discovery for any given product. Okay, I found something on the web for its addresses, right? And issues related to getting coverage or reimbursement for new technology. Since we know your need for knowledge doesn't always match our timing and delivery, all of our small business hangouts are recorded, captioned, and posted to the NHLBI YouTube channel in a playlist for you to access as needed. Just a brief disclaimer about this series, we present these hangouts for educational purposes only. They are not meant to be guidance for any particular project or technology. Also, the information provided is current for today. It's always possible that policies or uh, particular uh, technologies that we're discussing during these may change in the future. If you are developing a technology within the NHLBI mission space, which includes cardiovascular, pulmonary, hematologic, or sleep disordered research spaces, uh, you can feel free to reach out to us at the URL provided on this slide with additional questions about how to take advantage of the NHLBI small business program. If you are uh, working outside of our mission space, the information that you're going to hear today is still relevant, but we encourage you to reach out to a program officer at the appropriate institute or center related to your technology to discuss the specifics of your project. You can learn more about who to contact at the NIH SBIR website. A couple of housekeeping items. If you're having trouble accessing the video for today's presentation, but you have no trouble with the audio, please try to lock, leave the session and rejoin the event. If you're having trouble with the audio, there are a number of ways that you can uh, access the audio for today's event. You can try dialing in from the phone. You can try connecting through your computer. Or uh, if you are unable to use an audio connection, you can access live closed captioning either at the shortened URL provided on this slide, at the longer URL, which is currently in the chat box, or by using the media viewer option on your um, on your Hangout uh, WebEx page. All participants, uh, except for the presenters, will remain on mute throughout the webinar. You may have questions and we encourage you to ask them. You can do that by submitting your questions at any point in time via the Q&A panel or the chat panel on your screen. Please direct your questions to the panelists. In the unlikely event that you were to try to submit questions to all, we believe that we've set this up properly, that your questions will still only be visible to the panelists. 
If you're viewing the event in full screen mode, what you can do is hover over the small green bar at the top of your screen to get to the Q&A panel. We may find that multiple attendees have similar questions. If this happens, we're going to address them with a single answer. So just be aware that you may not hear us uh, address your question in exactly the phrasing you used when you typed it in. And I just want to remind you, you can type in your questions at any point during the event, and we will stop periodically to answer them. Due to the general nature of this presentation, we're not going to be able to answer questions that are specific to your technology. So please be aware that that is a private conversation that you can have with members of our office later in time. And finally, I want to make sure everyone is aware that this webinar is being recorded. Once the event is over, the recording will be posted to our YouTube channel along with all of our other archived small news hangouts. If you would like the slides from today's presentation, you can request those either through the WebEx event itself. There's a survey that will pop up at the end of the event on your screen. Or you can send an email to our office and request the slides. So now on to introductions for today's panelists. Dr. Stephen Flame is a Senior Special Advisor and Investor in Residence at the NHLBI Office of Translational Alliances and Coordination. He is also a Chairman Emeritus of Text Host Angels and a Director of the Angels Capital Association. He is Founder and President of Flame Partners Consulting and a Board Member of Pivotal Biosciences, Inc., Cardio Create, Inc., Leading Biosciences, Inc., and Chairman of the Board of Oncofloor Inc. Dr. Flame is also a Technology and Business Advisor to the William J. Von Liebig Center for Entrepreneurialism and Technology Advancement at the University of California, San Diego. Sven Carlson is the President and Co-Founder of Platelet Biogenesis. He has almost a decade of experience working across venture capital, business development, and finance. Prior to founding Platelet Biogenesis, Sven worked in mergers and acquisitions at J.P. Morgan as an analyst at a hedge fund and as a senior manager of investments at a clean energy venture fund. Sven received a B.S. in engineering from Cornell University and an MBA with distinction from New York University's Stern School of Business. And with those introductions, I now turn the presentation over to Dr. Flame to present uh, to describe how the Hangout will proceed today. Dr. Flake? Ah, there we go. I was on mute. Um, thanks very much, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, we're going to have a, an interesting session here with Sven Carlson from Platelet Biogenesis. The way this is going to work is so uh, what's really important uh, as many of you know, is uh, pitching your company or technology to uh, pot potentially investors or strategic partners is a very important step in the process of developing a company. And we, we hear a lot of pitches both here in Southern California with Tech Coast Angels and uh, with the SBIR program at NHLBI. And there are many, many different ways of doing pitches. Um, we have uh, picked this particular one because it has very, a lot of uh, very uh, positive uh, uh, features to it, and uh, Sven does a really good job doing this pitch. So the, what we're going to do today is I'm going to turn it over to Sven. He will uh, start to deliver his pitch, uh, moving his slides as, as he goes through his pitch, and then I'm going to interrupt him at various points during his pitch to point out to you, the audience, features of what he has just said that are important to investors and things to keep in mind when you're developing uh, your own pitch for your own, for your own company. Uh, you'll have an opportunity, as Chris said, to um, ask questions. Uh, if you put them in the Q&A box or the chat box, we'll try to review those. And um, my, my plan is to try to go through any questions that come forward during the pitch uh, at the end when, when Sven is, is finished. So with that, Sven, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you get started. 
Great. Steve, can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Excellent. Uh, so good afternoon. My name is Sven Carlson, and I'm the co-founder and chief business officer of Platelet Biogenesis. So I'm going to start by walking everybody through what platelets are, then why are they a major healthcare pain point today, and then finally what we're doing to solve this problem. So let me interrupt you right here, Sven, and just point out a couple of uh, features here that are extremely important. First of all, audience, you see his title slide. He has a tagline which is very clear. Uh, it says, platelets stop you from bleeding, we make platelets. So that's a very, very simple, clear statement of what the company is doing. So the audience automatically knows what's coming. And then the other thing that's important on this slide is that Sven's put his name and his title on the slide, as well as uh, some information about contact uh, points and ways to reach the company and a website. So th I highly recommend uh, the first slide of any pitch to have these features on it. Sven? So just in case any of you don't have a scientific or medical background, platelets are the band-aids of the bloodstream. So they're the cells in your blood that stop you from bleeding. Every major surgery or chemotherapy require platelet transfusion, and these are life-saving and they're critical for wound healing. So just in the U.S., over 2 million platelet units are transfused annually, <clears throat> and globally, this is a $20 billion market opportunity. Okay, so let me interrupt here and uh, point out that two things have just happened. Um, in, in a very brief and simple way, Sven has pointed out the importance of the market and the size of the market. And it's very clear, there's no question about it, it's a very large market, uh, which is definitely worth addressing. Sven? Great, so today all of these platelets come from volunteer human donors. And that's the major problem. The key problem is that supply cannot keep up with demand. So platelets store for five days, but two of these days are spent on viral and bacterial screening and a third is spent on transport. So essentially by the time a platelet is ready to be transfused, it typically is less than a two-day shelf life remaining. Okay, so I'm gonna interrupt one more time and point out that he has now defined the problem. Uh, and it is in fact an unmet medical need and it's very clear. And you see two pictures here. One is uh, on the left side is a patient in the hospital and the other is a military uh, situation where you have uh, uh, military folks. And so it's very clear there's two different uh, important markets, and he's defined that very clearly with, with these two slides. Sven? Great. Um, so I have a little bit left on this slide, but I'll just keep going through it. So as you can imagine, this uh, two-day effective shelf life creates an extremely precarious system where even minor disruptions can result in major stockouts. So what kind of disruption? So for example, cold winter weather, summer holidays, school vacations, anything that causes donors to choose to not go out and donate blood results in a major healthcare crisis. And that's in a normal operating environment, right? When there's a real emergency like the Boston Marathon bombing or 9-11, victims cannot get access to the platelets that they need. This is the situation today in Boston, in New York, major cities in developed countries. Outside of these areas, for literally billions of people around the world, there simply is no access to life-saving platelet transfusions at all. Now, all of these problems that I just addressed really come down to the fact that we're dependent on, a, on volunteers donating platelets using technology that has virtually not changed in 100 years. So our solution is to manufacture platelets. Right, we manufacture everything else in the healthcare system, so why not the blood cells? The way we do this is we start with a stem cell. We then differentiate this into a parent cell, which is called a megakaryocyte. And then we turn these parent cells into platelets. Now, we're not the first people to have this idea, but you basically needed three major breakthroughs to make this both technologically and commercially possible. So the first occurred in 1994 with the discovery of thrombopoietin, or TPO. This led to the generation of the first human platelets uh, via cell culture. Now, typically in cell culture, you can get about five to 10 platelets per megakaryocyte. 
The second major breakthrough occurred in 2006 with the invention of the human-induced pluripotent stem cell. And this is what Dr. Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize for. Now this allowed for a genetically consistent and scalable source material for the process. And if any of you have a manufacturing background, you can appreciate how important it is to have a consistent uh, starting product. And then the final breakthrough occurred in 2013 when our team, led by my co-founder, Dr. Thon, invented the platelet bioreactor that allows for the scalable generation of platelets at commercially viable yields. So I'm going to interrupt here and just point out that Sven's done two things here. He's talked about the manufacturing process, and he's also given you the history of why, the, why there's a problem and how they're solving the problem. Sven? So I'm going to get a little bit further into the science here. So we start with an induced pluripotent stem cell. Now this is essentially a skin cell that is backwards reprogrammed back to being a stem cell. The reason this is so important is that induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSCs, are renewable, which means we can make as many of them as we want. They're pathogen free, so there's no risk of viral contamination in our product. And it also offers us complete genetic control of our products so that in the future, we can do all sorts of cool things around developing designer platelets to target specific applications. Now, we then differentiate these iPSCs into megakaryocytes using a feeder-free and serum-free process. Now, this is important because it means we aren't introducing any additional contaminants into our product that could potentially concern the FDA in the future. And we've shown that the megakaryocytes we generate using this process are both structurally and functionally mature. Essentially, this means that they are real megakaryocytes, and this is all work that we've published on. But then the final step is to turn these megakaryocytes into platelets uh, at commercially viable yields. And for this, we turn to Mother Nature for inspiration. We look to the human body. Right? So in the human body, the megakaryocytes, or the parent cells, sit in the bone marrow. They then come to rest adjacent the blood vessels, and they extend little tendrils through called proplatelets into the blood vessels. And then the sheer force of flowing blood triggers these parent cells to produce platelets which then break off and circulate throughout your body. So our bioreactor, uh, at its simplest level, really just mimics this architecture. So there's a top channel and a bottom channel, and then a porous membrane in between. We feed the parent cells, again, the megakaryocytes, into the top chamber, uh, and then we flow media over them to mimic the flow of blood. Now, we found by exerting shear stresses on the cells during the differentiation process, we're able to significantly increase the yields that we achieve. Okay, so let me interrupt here and just point out that uh, Sven has presented about three slides, three or four slides here, which uh, ends with a little movie. And uh, for the uh, for your audiences, your investor audiences, many times uh, folks are not going to be uh, familiar with your technology, but you need to um, they need to understand what you're doing and how you're doing it. Uh, and so I think this is a very nice uh, set of slides that uh, even uh, even folks who are not familiar with platelet technology uh, really understand what's happening. Sven? Thanks. So how much better is our yield? Well, in static culture, again, you can typically get about five to ten platelets per parent cell. In our bioreactor, we're consistently able to achieve well over X platelets per parent cell which brings the cost down to a point where it's now commercially competitive with donor platelets. Now, critically, we've shown that the platelets we're making are real platelets. So ultrastructurally and morphologically, they're comparable to donor platelets. Again, this is all work that we've published on. There's a lot of data here, but essentially, uh, they look the same in vitro, so looking at biomarker expression size. They function the same in vitro, looking at activa activation and aggregation. And critically, in mice, uh, they function the same. So their circulation time is comparable, and we've shown that they actively contribute to clot formation. Okay, let me jump in here again and just point out that uh, many times uh, entrepreneurs make the mistake of spending too much time on the science and going into too much detail. Uh, Sven has covered the science in a couple of slides, 
there's a lot of detail here, but he doesn't really speak to the, the science in great detail. What this leaves the audience with is knowledge that there is a lot of science in the background. You've noticed that he's referenced publications. Uh, and then uh, those in the audience who are familiar with this type of science will recognize these plots and, and, and pictures and know that they can drill in and ask more detailed questions. But Sven has gone through this relatively quickly with few words and uh, made the point that the science is there. Sven? And not only can we produce real platelets, but we can make them cheaper than donor platelets. So by the time we're entering the market, we estimate that we'll be able to produce a unit of platelets for roughly X dollars. And not just cheaper, right? At a minimum, we know that they'll be sterile, so there's no risk of viral or bacterial contamination. They'll be younger, so they should have a longer shelf life. And they'll be available on demand and in remote locations. And again, it's a totally scalable process, so we can finally satisfy the unmet demand from patients. Okay, so I'm going to jump in and point out that this slide is titled Value Proposition, Better and Safer Platelets. This is a very clear summary of why this technology is going to be valuable, why it uh, should be a, a, a attractive to companies uh, who are interested in blood products. Uh, so it's a very clear easy to understand slide. Sven? So what's next for us? So essentially all the work that we've done to date has been using research grade cell lines. And we now need to go back and repeat the same validation work using clinical grade cell lines. After we complete that process, we'll receive IND approval, which we believe is the major de-risking step for our business. Following IND approval, there will be a phase one trial that will take approximately X months and cost X million dollars, followed by a phase two trial that will take approximately Y months and cost Y million dollars. So in total, we're looking at just Z number of years and Z million dollars to receive BLA approval and begin selling these platelets into the market. Okay, so I'm gonna interrupt and make a couple of comments on this slide. Um, so, uh, First of all, this is a very clear slide that shows where we are today, and when the dates and times are in here, it'll show to investors uh, very clearly when the company will be selling platelets in, in, in revenue. Um, and, and so you need a clear sort of timeline Gantt chart type uh, uh, slide that sort of covers all of those um, features. Um, you also see in here where the IND approval would be, um, where phase one uh, is completed, when where phase, phase two is completed, et cetera. Now, the other thing that I'm gonna point out is that he has in here uh, that it's gonna cost money to get to phase one and it's gonna cost money to get to phase two. He's left the, the actual dollars out of this slide and there's a very good reason for that. So the Securities and Exchange Commission has passed something called the HALOS Act. And in, in that act, they basically tried to make it possible for uh, private early stage companies to raise, uh, raise money. And in that act, it's called, uh, there's a rule, it's called Rule 506 of Regulation D. And one of the fallouts of that uh, rule and that act was that if a private company does a public solicitation of funds, they put themselves into, a, into a, a company category that makes it more difficult for angel investors and early stage investors to actually invest in the company. And I'm not gonna go into the details for that, but the bottom line is that if you are interested in raising money from private investors as an early stage company, you have to be 100% sure that your audience is composed of only accredited investors. If, they, if there are non-accredited investors in your audience, you are doing what's called a public solicitation. So this audience today is non-accredited because I'm sure there are people listening in who are not accredited investors and we don't have any records of, of the audience in terms of their accredit, accreditation possibilities. So you have to assume it's not an accredited investor audience. So if Sven had listed that, you know, we're trying to raise 
a certain number of millions of dollars to achieve phase one, he would by definition be doing a, um, a public solicitation. So you just be aware of this. Uh, when you go to pitch to a VC or to an angel group that is 100% accredited in the audience, um, just be sure that that's the case ahead of time. And then you can go ahead and put in your slide the details of your, your round, the amount of your round, what you're going to use the round for, et cetera. But unless you have that, uh, in, in, you have that knowledge about your audience, you should avoid um, doing a public solicitation. Sven. But perhaps most importantly, this is the right team to execute on this vision. So my two co-founders are both Harvard professors with decades of experience studying platelet production. We've assembled a top team of scientific advisors and business advisors who have founded companies that have generated billions of dollars in exit value for their investors. Okay, so let me jump in here one more time and just point out that what we have here is a slide which provides a lot of important information to investors and he covered it very quickly, but it's very clear. So first of all, it's nice to have photographs because investors like to know who they're investing in and who they're working with. Um, there's not a lot of detail about uh, each of these individuals, but you can see who they are and where their, where their affiliations are. And if you're interested as an investor, you can, uh, you can go back and, and uh, drill in on each of these, these people. But he's covered this very nicely, uh, and he's got all the information that's required here on this slide. Sven? So in summary, this is a $20 billion market opportunity. It works. The technology proof of concept is complete. We've assembled a very strong team with deep expertise, and we have a clear plan going forward. But perhaps most importantly, you know, when we're successful in bringing this product to market, we're going to extend life-saving platelet transfusions to literally billions of people who lack that access today. Okay, so a summary slide in your pitch is always really important to have. Uh, Sven's done an excellent job with this one. He has uh, five bullets. The printing is very large and very clear, and all of the really important points are here. Um, a lot of times you see summary slides that are much more detailed and harder to read. This one is about the right uh, level of detail, uh, touching on the right uh, points uh, from his pitch. Sven? So we hope that you will join our growing list of partners and supporters to help us realize this vision. Thank you for your time. Okay, so then the last comment I'll make is that the last slide in your pitch is probably going to be the one that's going to sit up on the uh, screen during the Q&A, and it should have uh, your contact information and whatever important other information you feel should, should be on there. This one has uh, partners, uh, which is a really nice touch, uh, but it also has the website for the company and so forth. So um, this is an, a very important uh, feature of a pitch is to have the proper last slide sitting there during the Q&A. Sven, I don't think you have anything else. Is that right? That's right. That's the end of it. Okay. So we have a couple of questions that uh, I'm going to try to answer. So. Um, one of them, uh, one question uh, says, are investors uh, as concerned with published data or are they, uh, let me just see here, I need to bring this back. Or are they more, I can't see the rest of the question. Um, so I, I think what, what we're trying to find out here is about uh, published data. So investors are, um, not as concerned about whether the data is published, although I, it, the investors who are savvy about a technology will know uh, what, what journals are peer-reviewed and which ones are considered to be um, the better journals, and so it, that will make a difference to them. Um, but generally speaking, the earlier the technology, uh, the less publication you see, and then uh, if you do have publication, then the investor is going to say, well, wait a minute, did you uh, manage to uh, file all the IP to protect it and so forth? So, so publications are good as long as you take all the right steps 
uh, in preparing to, to publish, especially with respect to um, protecting the technology through intellectual property. Um, let's see, there's another question. Is it advisable to use the phrase, phrases like no risk? So I think, Sven, at one point you said, uh, mentioned something about there's no risk uh, with this type of, a, of an approach. Um, so that's a really good question. Uh, in this kind of a, a presentation, what I always recommend to the entrepreneur is that you can, um, you can make any assertion that you want. Um, you, you have to be able to circle back later during due diligence and substantiate uh, the, the assertion that you've made. So obviously in biotechnology, the, there really is never no risk. Um, low risk would probably have been a better uh, set of words to use, but um, it, it's okay to say things like that. You just have to be able to go back and, and justify um, the assertion that you made. Let's see. Yeah, we I would just have... add to that. Yep. Go I ahead. I would just add to that. I would never. Uh, I would just caution anybody against ever saying no risk from a financial perspective, because obviously, with any early stage investing, there's always risk and even though it may be lower risk to patients or whatever, there's still plenty of financial risk along the way. Right, that's absolutely true. Uh, there's another question um, concerning uh, the, the intellectual property. Uh, how important is it that the intellectual property remains proprietary and protected? Um, so generally speaking, investors will want the the technology to be protected through some type of intellectual property protection, whether it be um, copyrights, trademarks, patents, uh, you know, some sort of an approach that keeps a competitor from coming in and competing in your space. Um, the timing of patents are important. So if you have a patent that's been issued and it's running out of its life, and you have no way to extend it, that is a negative for an investor. So it's important for investors to know that they're actually engaging with companies that have viable intellectual property, and that property is going to be present uh, and existing long enough so that a company can exit it and actually return capital to, to the investor. Let's see. So somebody did ask whether you need a slide about intellectual property protection. Uh, and competition or pipeline products that are competitive in nature. So yes, um, Sven did have a slide that mentioned the fact that he had pa uh, patents in process, um, and so he he did not have a, a specific slide on intellectual property. Um, it depends a little bit on how much uh, IP you've got. Uh, generally speaking, I recommend that there be a slide uh, that sort of goes through that <clears throat> or Sometimes there's a slide that talks about the IP as well as the reimbursement plan. Um, and then the other is competition. Uh, I also recommend a competitive analysis slide <clears throat> that shows that you know who else is competing in your space. In this case, in Sven's case, it's not so important because uh, the, the, he covered the competition, uh, which is basically platelets uh, from donors. But in most cases, um, you want to have a list of companies that are doing the same, trying to do the same thing you're doing, and then show why your technology is better than theirs. The format for such a slide is one we call the bingo slide, where you have potentially features um, on, a ver on the vertical, act of vertical um, columns and the companies on the horizontal columns, and you have check marks where uh, the companies are achieving uh, a particular feature and blanks where the company's not. And your, hopefully your company has check marks on all of the features that are important and compared to everybody else. Uh, Steve, I would see. just uh, add one comment there that this is the, so this is my seven minute version. In the 10 minute one, I do add in more on the IP and the, the competition. But with right. all these, it's really, you know, it's, it's just a decision of what's the most important information you can include to get to the next conversation. So saying that, you know, like I mentioned on one slide that it is patented technology, I think that's enough to get me to the next conversation about what are those patents rather than spending a full minute talking about, you know, the IP protection and the intricacies of that. So it really yeah. depends on the length of the pitch you're giving. 
Absolutely, that's a <clears throat> that's a really good point. Uh, there's another question on how to answer the addressable market size question. Um, uh, Sven, I think I'll let you answer that. Uh, well, again, in this short version, you just sort of need to put the, the number up and make sure it's something that's defensible because, you know, any investor is going to dig into the addressable market size uh, that you present later on, but there's no way to spend, you know, a minute or two of your pitch talking about the, the intricacies and where the market is and where the pricing dynamics are. You just have to sort of show that you've done the work and that there is something that you could defend, uh, you know, when you get to that next conversation. Right, right. Um, so he talked about uh, the, the market size as being over $20 billion, so it's obviously a very large market, and the idea there was to attract investors. And like I said earlier, you can, you can say anything you want in a, <clears throat> in a pitch like this. You just have to be able to go back and, and, uh, and uh, provide information during due diligence to flesh out the, the reasoning behind what you said. Um, next question here is, uh, should there not be more discussion about FDA and regulatory process? <clears throat> and so I think once again, uh, if you have more time, <clears throat> you should have a slide that talks about your regulatory plan, uh, what agency you're, what part of the agency you'll be talking to, what are the steps and so forth. But again, in a seven minute pitch, um, you, you may not be able to get to that, <clears throat> to get to that level of detail. And then uh, next yeah. question is what, I'm sorry, go ahead, Sven, if you have something to say. Uh, yeah, I was just going to add to that again. I think it's one of those things you want to show that you have done the work and you have the information to back that up. So I have the one slide with the longer timeline that shows the amount of time and the amount of money each of these is going to take. So it shows that we we do ha we have done the work. We've thought about what the, the clinical trials will look like, and usually in Q&A, that's one of the first questions we'll get, and then we can talk through it. Right, right. So we have a similar question. There's a lot of questions about um, why didn't you talk about more about certain things. There's a question here, why did you not include more information about the, um, the, the qualifications of the principals in the company? Again, uh, I guess you could put that on the slide. Uh, not necessary, as I mentioned, you don't really need to talk about that in a short pitch like this, um, but it's important to have the, the names of the people on there and their, their degrees and their affiliations and then during a due diligence process or the next meeting, you can go into more detail. Uh, if you have a pitch that's, so this was a sort of a seven minute pitch. If you have a 15 minute pitch, which is frequently a, the length, you can cover uh, more uh, detail in that, uh, in, in that area as well. Yeah, and I would, I would also caution against putting too much detail on the slides because if you start putting a lot of text on the slides, then the people you're presenting to stop looking at you and they start reading the slide and they start reading the detailed biography of one of your co-founders instead of listening to what you're saying. Uh, so, you know, minimize the amount of text up there and make sure that the focus is on you and not on the actual slides. So that's a really, really important point. Um, you, you don't want to provide the audience with uh, too much uh, information coming in at the same time. Um, the next question here is, did any investors question about the on-demand model? Uh, how did you answer such a question since it's well known uh, obtaining platelets uh, from IPS cells need several weeks and they must be prepared uh, patients specifically? So, uh, Sven, I'm going to let you answer that one. Uh, sure. So, great question. So, we can actually, the creation of the mega carry sites takes a couple weeks, but we can actually freeze the mega carry sites in what's called a pre mega carry site state uh, and cryo preserve them in that state. And then they, those could be thawed out in 24 to 48 hours to produce platelets. Okay, very good. Um, the next question here is Do you need a slide showing who are your potential acquirers or exit strategy for the company? So again, um, this is one that you would probably want to have in a 15 minute pitch. Uh, I always recommend that, especially if you're talking to investors, you need to tell the investors how they're going to get their money back plus uh, a multiple of their money and when that's going to happen. Um, so the reason, one of the reasons why that slide is not in this pitch is because this is a, this is a public could be defined as a public solicitation, and you have to avoid talking too much about the deals, uh, the details of your deal, 
otherwise you'll get branded as doing a public solicitation. But yes, if you're talking to an accredited investor audience, uh, you will need to talk about uh, exit strategy, uh, return on investment, and so forth. Um, let's see, we have one more question. I think investors often want to know path to commercialization and exit. Uh, your thoughts? Uh, so my thoughts on that is yes, uh, the go-to-market strategy is, uh, is often really important. So how do you get your product out to the consumer, whoever the consumer, whoever the, uh, uh, whoever the, uh, the consumer is for the product? Sven, do you want to just say a few words about this one? Um, no, I'd say I'd, I agree with that. Uh, you know, again, it's just a decision about, you know, we're trying to identify what are the major risks in a seven-minute pitch. You know, that's certainly a risk further down the road, but probably one that's not primary uh, for us given the sort of preclinical stage of our company. Uh, so we just made the decision that, you know, we'd rather focus on other things given the short amount of time. Right. Very good. Okay. Well, I think that uh, summarizes and goes gets through all of the uh, questions that I am seeing here. So I want to thank Sven Carlson for doing this with us today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and I'm going to turn this back to Chris Sassiello. Chris? Steve, can I make uh, one, more, one more comment? Oh, of course. Yeah, I just want to suggest one thing that we found useful uh, after doing this for several months is we broke up our deck into basically having two versions. So this is the presentation version of the deck, which has lots of pictures, very little text. And if we gave this to somebody without any context and without, you know, myself or somebody else there to walk them through it, they'd probably be pretty confused about what they were looking at. Uh, we also have a second version that's basically uh, the deck that we would send to somebody that's much more detailed, has a lot of text on each slide, has more slides, et cetera, where they could pick it up without anybody there and understand what we're doing and, and what our business model is essentially. And I think trying to thread the needle between those two uh, and try and you know, have a one size fits all deck becomes really challenging. Uh, and so that was, it's kind of a pain to maintain two separate ones, but that was something that we found really effective uh, in just sort of splitting up, you know, what is the actual purpose of the deck? Yeah, and that, that's a really good point, Sven. Um... I've known, I know companies that have four or five decks, um, and they're, each deck is designed to speak to a specific type of audience. So, for example, uh, well, if you're if you're looking for angel investors, you need to you need to create a deck that's uh, right for them. If you're trying to get money from a venture capital firm, um, the deck is going to be slightly different. If you're looking for a strategic partner and you're presenting to a company that you think might invest as a strategic or potentially be uh, uh, an acquirer, that deck is going to be a little bit different as well. Um, so it, it's really important to know who your audience is and to sort of tailor the deck uh, to the audience. This deck is tailored to uh, sort of an audience that is um, not necessarily a sophisticated in investor audience. Um, but more sort of general audience, and what Sven has is another deck that's probably more detailed and more uh, targeted towards a, uh, more of a sophisticated investor audience. Okay, I think that we're good. I'm going to turn it back to uh, Chris. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Sven, both of you, for doing an excellent job today walking through the, uh, the task pitch, as it were. And I know that I saw at least one person requesting information about how to get today's slides so that they can use them as a model. And so I want to just point out to people that you can either provide your email address in the brief feedback form that's going to pop up on your browser after this webinar is completed, or you can submit your request directly to our office, and the link for that is currently showing on your screen. When you go to that inquiry form, you simply uh, go in through resources inquiry and educational resources and tell us which hangout you would like the deck for. Any of the hangouts that we've presented, we are more than happy to provide the slides for. And then finally, if you'd like to find out about upcoming events, uh, such as additional small biz hangouts or funding opportunities uh, from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, I encourage you to sign up for our listserv. 
Uh, stay connected with us. We have a Twitter account. We try and post information about upcoming events, funding opportunities, news of interest to our uh, innovator community. And I want to thank everyone, Dr. Swain, Mr. Carlson, and all of our audience members for making today's event as successful as it has been. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful remainder of your day.